Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, The Troglodytes Guitar Show. I have to share this listing with you guys. It is just so absolutely hilarious. But I do want to be abundantly clear. I'm not making this video to shame the seller, to make fun of them. I want to do it to A, correct their listing so people actually know what they're buying, and B, to teach you guys some interesting Gibson history. So to protect this seller, I'm just going to blur his name out through this video. So, this was on Reverb for open auction for seven days, in which it is ending very soon, described as a vintage Gibson 1976 limited edition exclusive run Les Paul Classic Light Honey Burst with Case. Man, I bet that title is really impressive if you don't know your history, but let's dive into this. So first off, we've got a year here, 1976, and they're claiming it's a Les Paul Classic. Okay, here's the problem with that. The first year of the Les Paul Classic is 1989. You can find a few of them birthed in 89, but 1990 is like that first full year. So right away, we know something is not right there. But to call it a classic light? That's a model that didn't exist until very recently. It was an AMS exclusive. As far as being a Gibson product that's always been offered, it's never been offered. But what makes the classic lights interesting is the fact that they utilize this really small body, you know, about the same width of an SG. And this was first done in the late 80s, on a Les Paul anyways. In fact, here's actually one of the original prototypes for what they called the custom light. According to the serial number of this one, it appears the first year of those is 1986, but that's a really late 86. So by the time the public got it, it was pretty much 1987. This is firmly in the Henry J era. So put yourself in Henry's shoes. People are still complaining your guitars are too heavy. You've already done the weight relieving starting around 1982, 1983 in a transitional period, and that wasn't enough. So they found these thinner bodied ones. Now the original 80s run got revamped back in 2013, then there was another run in 14, and some in 2015, and then another very good run in 2016. Now those all had various specs. You can check out the reviews and demos here. So now switching back over here, so yeah, that can't be right, and the year can't be right. Maybe he's got the limited edition exclusive run part right. But first let's talk about Honey Burst. Nope, that doesn't look like a Honey Burst to me. <laughs> this poor seller. Honey Burst often looks something similar to this. Now there's many of various shades and hues, both Custom Shop and USA, but the official title of Honey Burst was not actually used on that many things. A lot of people just find like a faded tobacco sunburst and they just call it Honey Burst because that's what it reminds them of. Here's a really cool 1990 done up in something that somebody might call Honey Burst. Or here's one from 1976 that would just more accurately be called Tobacco Sunburst that was advertised as Honey Burst. So looking at this, and then looking at that, yeah, we don't have the finish right either. This would most accurately be called natural. So we've debunked the color, we've debunked the model. Let's find out, is it actually a Gibson at all and from 1976? Because I'm sure you're just wondering, what is going on with this? I've never even seen a Les Paul body like that. So let's go to our serial number here. Okay, this explains a lot. So here's how you read this serial number. Zero. You skip the next three, four. That tells you the year of production. So this is a 2004 Gibson Les Paul Studio. We'll dive a little bit more into that in a minute. So how on earth did they get to 1976? You're probably wondering. This, my friends, is why you don't use online decoders or you just use them as a guide. Because here we go. Here's a real Les Paul Custom from 76. Wow. That's probably the nicest one I have ever seen. Maybe it's just the yellow case making it look pretty good. But anyways, let's get back to the point. 76s have serial numbers that look like this. It's part of the decal era. Late 75, 76, and 77 utilize a decal serial number. So if it starts 99, you know it's a late 75. If it starts 00, it means 1976. And then 1977, it starts with 06. And then after that, they introduced the serial number system that we still use yet today, although slightly modified, which is what the seller has here. Year, day, 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 the other year, and then your production number. So this was made the 34th day of 2004. It was the 430th guitar stamped on this particular day. So what they did is they likely plugged this into some sort of an online serial number decoder, and it picked up the 00 as being, okay, 1976, because it's the leading 00s, or they looked up information online and they heard that. But it needs to be on a decal for that to be true. So there we go. There's literally nothing in this title that is correct, unfortunately. 
but we're starting to get there as far as identifying it for the seller. Because I guess to throw him a bone, he is right, this is a limited edition run. Because we need to talk about the top now and the back. More specifically, just the body. This is not the normal wood grain you find on a Les Paul. You're probably asking me, are you sure it's even a real Gibson? Yes, this is a Swamp Ash Studio from 2004. Gibson has done some runs here and there of Swamp Ash Studio. Some of them have maple necks, some of them have mahogany. And as you can see here, they're actually fairly well respected. They sell anywhere between, you know, 700 to sometimes as much as 13. But this is what this thing would have originally looked like. So notice, this model does not actually even have any fret markers on the fretboard. That's cool, I've never realized that before. And it was very popular to modify these things to like an all blacked out look because of that whole matching fretboard. But I always just paid attention to these beautiful wood grained bodies. That's why I like Swamp Ash, especially on Les Pauls. You find them more commonly in the Fender realm and in the PRS offerings. But the run from 2003 to 2005 had that mahogany neck. And something else that can help us date this guitar even further is the case itself. So we can see here, somebody has customized it with their rocker skull dude guy. Some other stuff going on here, but it says Gibson USA. So that generally means 90s through the early 2000s if it has a logo like that. Now, if it has a font like this, you know it's like mid 2000s till very recently when they started to change that up again. But if you look inside, this one has a case shroud. That's what this is officially called, a shroud. Some people call it like a blanket. Also take note that this has a combo lock on it. Gibson stopped putting those on after about the mid 2000s because it just kept innocent people innocent rather than actually doing anything productive. Pretty much the only thing those are good for is like keeping your kids out of your guitar stash. But another characteristic mark is the type of handle that's right here. That's the braided style. But if you have a black Gibson USA case, and it's got a black interior, it still has a black case shroud, you know it's from that early mid 2000s era. So even without looking at any of the guitar, we can deduct all that information just by looking at this thing. Isn't that fascinating? Like when you know the nitty gritty details and have been around this stuff all this time, how easy it is to date things. So I think that just about wraps this all up, but we can take a look at some of these modifications here. It's on Les Paul mode because they've covered it over with some sort of a sticker there. I mean, it even says studio on the truss rod cover, so I'm not quite sure where they got Les Paul Classic. Maybe they posted it on some forum and was like, hey, help me. And that's the answer they got. I was like, I offer private help sessions on my website, right? You can pay me to take a look at whatever you're looking at to give you my thoughts and opinions on it. And then there's the cheap freeway. I mean, you can go to any Facebook group or Les Paul forum and you generally can get very good advice. But then there's a, a few people far out in left field that if you listen to them, they just lead you in the wrong direction. It's frustrating sometimes reading some of those threads but it appears we've got some sort of like a joker sticker on here i'm red socks some sort of a random humbucker other stickers not quite too sure what that is it looks painted on but i think this is still restorable especially since it's a natural finish because refinishing this would not be a big deal you could do an exotic color or a transparent color or you could just go back to natural and it'd probably look okay if the stickers don't come off cleanly so let's just assume this is like a husk how much is this actually worth because despite them thinking it's a 1976 limited edition classic light honey burst, they almost have the price about right, which always surprises me. This happens all the time on eBay. If somebody has something incredibly rare that they don't even realize how rare it is, they list it as something normal, but yet they still somehow get the premium price correct. Now this is like the opposite where they have the project price correct. So we saw recent sales, you know, within the past two years show us 650 to 1300. So let's take the 1300, take about half off that price. That tells you what a husk with some parts could potentially be worth. Let's call about 650 to get us in the ballpark because there are people who love to buy these projects. I could realistically see this husk, just the husk, nothing else on it for about 450 to 500. This case right here, if it was in better shape, could be worth up to 350, but something like this, you know, probably 200. So since it has something Thing. let's be generous call it 500 plus 200 on the case it's about 700 so they're not too far off here if somebody really 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 wanted this piece they could but once you add in shipping costs i really don't see this one selling for 850 because you'd probably just be better off waiting for one that has a little bit of wear and tear and purchase that but I hope you troglodytes enjoyed, you know, learning a little bit about Gibson history, serial numbers, when models came out, what colors often mistakenly get called, and the fact that you can get Swamp Ash bodied Les Paul Studios. But I think we've got a little bit more time left tonight. What else is going on on eBay? I've been watching eBay a lot more. There has been some 
interesting stuff pop up. All the cool stuff almost sells instantaneously. And all the stuff that you think is cool and you buy it ends up having issues when it gets here. <laughs> like this would be interesting to talk about. So right here, Jeff's Music Gear. This is the used shop within Sweetwater. So when Sweetwater gets a guitar that gets busted up in shipping, or the customer breaks it and says it was shipping, they send it back to Sweetwater, and then instead of selling something broken on their site, they transfer it to Jeff's Music Gear, and they put them on eBay, and my goodness, they get crazy money for this stuff. This thing brand new. I guess they're about $2,000 now, because it's the 61 style original collection. And granted, that's a really easy repair if you know what you're doing, because it's not all splintered up or anything. That should definitely be fixable. But a repaired guitar is generally worth about 30 to 50% less than its stock format. So this guitar used, I mean, you're generally looking, what, 14 to 16 if you look at the demo shop or some other guys just selling a regular used one with some wear and tear. So I don't really understand why people bid these up as much as they do. Maybe they just like the whole, I'm the one that's going to fix it. It's going to be repaired right aspect to it. But there's definitely better deals out there. But you can find quite a few of these things. I mean, here's one from Oakland, New Jersey. Very similar stuff. Now this one's the vibrato version. So I think those are about 2,200 new now. Well, this poor thing met a very similar fate. I would say that one's even easier to repair. If I was gonna choose one of them, it'd be that. Oh, whoa, that's really trippy. I was trying to figure out, well, what, what is that screw coming from? I thought it was coming from like their backdrop. But you look at the front, it's, oh, okay. There's a truss rod covered there. It's just so white, it matches the background. That's got a lot of surface area. I would assume that would be your best bet if you're just going to repair it yourself. Because yeah, you, you can just take a little bit of tight bond, clamp it, you're probably good as new, or just saw that off, make yourself your own headless SG. So I guess if you're in a project, keep an eye out on eBay, because for some reason, Jeff's music gear is not on reverb. And you generally don't find broken guitars on reverb too often. It's either that or they sell too fast. But here's an interesting listing. My best advice for somebody who's, you know, trying to figure out what a guitar is worth, watch these open auctions because that tells you the bare minimum of what it could be worth and or the most it could be worth, depending on the situation. Like rare guitars, generally they don't sell too well at auction and that's how dealers get a good deal on them. But guitars like these, they generally reach like the top value of what they can get. So it can help you gauge a market. So looking at this one, everything looks good there. We've got our ebony fretboard. We can see it's the T-top pickups. So that's the most important part of a DePaul because these pickups are very expensive to replace. We've got the knobs that it should have. Everything's looking original on this and we've got the chainsaw case. Unfortunately, missing one latch that devalues it quite a bit. But I mean, you could do your own restoration job, but we've got some finish wear right here. Pretty common on this model. All right, so all original, heavy wear with the case, broken latch. I would assume this will sell somewhere between 11 to 1200 in today's market. It could go for a little bit more. And we'll end tonight's episode with this poor thing. So I saw this thing a couple weeks ago titled A Very Good Ukulele to Use. And I thought, okay, yeah, it's like some mom or dad trying to sell off the children's thing that they never ended up using. But then you get to the back and no, that, that's not a real ukulele. That's a plastic toy. <laughs> So, is it a very good ukulele to use? Nah, probably not. Not with those types of tuning pegs. But it's got stitch on it. Ow. So it's interesting. I and mean, I'm pretty sure this is what you can get at like the dollar store. Similar to the legendary Guitar Guitares that I was lucky enough to document in this episode. And that says, uh, very good ukulele. Please buy, I'm very broke. But look at that, a screaming $1 deal for shipping. That's fantastic. Now that you put it that way, we will see it unboxed soon. Random act of charity aside, <laughs> that's it for tonight's episode. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care.